I'd like to do just a little bit more notation, and this is going to be more uh, sums of squares. And the notation uh, for these three things, we've got s, x, x, s, x, y, and s, y, y. So s, x, x is the sum from i equal 1 to n of x i minus x bar squared. And so this is the variance in x. Well, it's not actually, but it's essentially. It would need to be like divided by n to get uh, back uh, toward the variance of x, but it's, it's very similar to that. That's the way we can think of it. Um, s x y is the sum i equal 1 to n of x i minus x bar times y i minus y bar. So there's no squared. Um, this is essentially the covariance of x and y. And then we've seen the s y y before. This is the sum i equal 1 to n y i minus y bar squared. So that's the same as the s s t, and it is essentially the variance in y. And the reason why it's nice to have these uh, terms is because we can use them to compute the regression coefficients. So again, this is something that I might ask you to do on an exam. I might give you some information about uh, sums of squares and ask you to tell me what the equation of the line is. So one thing that you'd need to know is beta 1 hat is equal to s x y divided by s x x. Um, so this is an important uh, formula that you're going to want to keep somewhere. And then once you have beta 1, then you can use point-slope formula to solve for beta 0 hat. Um, and all we would need is a point on the line. Luckily, um, the least squares regression line always goes through the point x bar, y bar. So if we know that beta 1 hat is s x y over s x x, and that the line always goes through x bar, y bar, then I could plug in y bar is equal to beta 0 hat plus uh, beta 1 hat x bar, and then I could subtract off beta 1 hat x bar on both sides, and then I could say beta 0 hat is going to be equal to y bar minus beta 1 hat x bar. So that's another formula. You should be able to sort of derive it, but if you wanted to do it more simply, you could use that. And there's even one more trick. So if you have simple linear regression, then beta 1 hat is equal to s x y over s x x. And in the case of simple linear regression, that's r, the correlation, times the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x. So you could also have that formula, where s y is the standard deviation of y and sx is the standard deviation of x and r is the correlation. And again, once we had that beta 1 hat, we could use that to find the beta 0 hat. So let's do an example. So I've got um, my serial data. Um, I have my mean and standard deviation for both calories and sugar. And then down here, this is the correlation of calories and sugar. I know it turned out really small, but that's what that is. So I have to think about which variable is my x and which variable is my y. In this case, uh, my y is calories and my x is sugar because my y is going to be my response and my x is my explanatory. So then I can say beta 1 hat is equal to r times s y over s x and that's going to be the 0.515 times 
SY is 22.16 over 4.60. And I think that turns out to be 0 0.515 times 4.81. And overall, it's 2.48. So that's my beta 1 value. And then maybe I'll do the beta 0 up, a, up on top. So beta 0 hat is going to be my y bar minus beta 1 hat x bar. And so then I could plug in my y bar is going to be the 101.6. My beta 1 is 2.48. And my x bar is 5.71. So that's 101.6 minus 14.16 is 87.44. And then I could write out my whole equation. I've got calories hat equal to 87.44 plus 2.48 times sugar. So again, maybe I'd ask you to do this on an exam. I'd give you some summary statistics and I'd ask you, what's the equation of the line? So there's one more thing from chapter two that I'd like to talk about before you go over and go through the lab, and that is intervals. So remember in STAT 220, if we were going to do an interval, it would be a statistic plus or minus something that depends on the distribution and the alpha level times the standard error. So it could be an X bar plus or minus a Z star value times a standard error. And we would interpret it, you know, we are 95% confident that the true mean is between the bottom of the interval and the top of the interval. And then last week we talked about doing a confidence interval for a slope. So we had a beta 1 hat as our statistic, our something that depends on the distribution was a T star value, and our standard error was the standard error of the slope. Um, so we could write it out like this. And then we would say, you know, we're 95% confident that for a one unit increase in X, we would see a increase or decrease, depending on if it's positive or negative, in the response of between the bottom of the interval and the top of the interval units. So if I was gonna sort of imagine this in space, that's like, okay, is my slope really positive? Is it a little bit less positive? Is it a little bit less positive? If you had an interval that had some, some negative slopes in it as well as positive slopes, that would tell you we're not very confident about this, uh, this slope. But if you just had a, you know, a few positive slopes with a little bit of a difference, okay, we're pretty confident that it's a positive slope, but it's between this and that. So that's confidence intervals for a slope. But we also have um, confidence intervals for specific values. And those kind of get broken down into confidence intervals for means at a specific value or for individuals at a specific value. And the way that we do these confidence intervals is with this equation. So we start with a y hat value, so a predicted value. And then we use a t star value, again, depending on the t distribution, and a standard error. And um, the thing that uh, is for means, we call a confidence interval. And the thing that's for individuals, we call a prediction in interval. And I think these names are pretty terrible. Um, we call many, many things confidence intervals in statistics. But in this case, when we say a confidence interval versus a prediction interval, uh, a confidence interval means it's for a specific value, but we're thinking about a mean of that specific value. Um, and the, th the only thing that's different between these two intervals is the standard error. The y hat is going to be the same, and the t star is going to be the same. I'll never ask you to do the computation of the standard error by hand. Um, I'm just going to ask you, you know, sort of conceptual questions or maybe doing something in R, but just so that you know what the equation looks like. So we've got the standard deviation of the residuals, the square root, 1 over n, that's the sample size, plus, and then on the top, we've got our particular x star value, so whatever x value we're interested in, minus our x bar squared, over the sum from i equal 1 to n of xi minus x bar squared, 
Um, and, and that'll be the standard error for the confidence interval. And then the one for the prediction interval is almost the same. It still has one over N. It still has the same stuff uh, in the fraction. The piece that is new is this one plus. So that's the important thing. Um, and that one uh, in the square root is just gonna make sure that the standard error uh, for a prediction interval is always wider than the one for the confidence interval. So it just adds more variability. So the standard error for the y hat is always greater than the standard area error for the mu hat. So prediction intervals are always wider than confidence intervals. So let's think about an example. This is that calories and sugar model from before where we're trying to predict the number of calories in a cereal based on the amount of sugar. And um, for the homework, I had you just use R like a big calculator. So you plugged into the model equation 87.4 plus 2.5 times sugar. Uh, so if you wanted to do a prediction for a cereal with one gram of sugar, 87.4 plus 2.5 times 1, that's 87.4 plus 2.5, which is 89.9. But there's also a programmatic way to do predictions in R, and that's using the predict function. And the way the predict function works is you give it a model object, and then you give it a new data set. So you say new data is equal to, and then you have to at least make a little mini version of a data set. And so in this case, I'm gonna make a mini data set, which is gonna say sugar is equal to one. So basically it is a tiny data set with one column and one row. And we're just gonna do a prediction for that. And so if I do that prediction and I don't put any arguments into the end of the function, it just tells me that predicted value, 89.9. But I can also use it to make intervals. Um, and these intervals are for a particular value. They're for sugar equal to one, but one of them is a confidence interval and one is a prediction interval. And for both of the intervals, it starts with a fit. That's our y hat. And the y hat is going to be the same either way. It's the, it's the number that we got from this first model. Um, and that's the 89.9. But then we've got the lower end of the interval and the upper end of the interval. And those are the things that are going to be different. So I'm going to write out the sentences for these two. So we're going to start with uh, a confidence interval. We are 95% confident that the mean number of calories for cereals with one gram of sugar is between 80.5, I'll round, and 99.3 calories. So the mean number of calories for cereals with one gram of sugar is between those two numbers. And then maybe I'll write my other sentence over here. So uh, we are 95% confident that a particular cereal with one gram of sugar has between uh, 49.6 and 130.2 calories. So that interval is much wider. If I have to make a prediction about a particular cereal, I need a much wider interval in order to be 95% confident. If I get to make a prediction about a mean, I'm going to have a narrower interval because I know that means kind of balance out highs and lows and randomness in that way. So I can be much more precise. So this is one task that I want you to be able to do, find those intervals and interpret them. Um, and then the other main thing that I want you to know is that uh, the, the intervals, um, the narrower interval is the confidence interval and the wider interval is the prediction interval, but both intervals are narrowest at X bar. So both intervals narrowest at X bar. And if we go back and look at those standard error calculations, you might be able to see why. 
So in the standard error calculation, we do this thing x star minus x bar. And if x star, the x that we're interested in, is the mean of x, then x star minus x bar is zero. And that means that this whole term is going to go to zero. And so then our standard error is just this piece here. And the same thing happens um, in the other standard error. If that all goes to zero, then this is my standard error. So both of these intervals get narrowest at x bar. Um, the, uh, the standard error bars that come with ggplot2, which I've been mostly turning off so far in this class, that's where I put the se equal false, that's for standard error. The se that it's showing us is the confidence interval, um, and it's, uh, like you can see, it's sort of narrowest around the, the mean of x. So somewhere, somewhere in here it's getting, it's getting nice and narrow, and then it's getting wider. Um, at the at the edges. And then you don't need to know how to put the dotted lines for the um, prediction interval onto your ggplot. It takes a little bit of weird data wrangling, but I just wanted to plot it out for you. So the gray band in the middle, that's my confidence interval. And then the red dotted lines, that's my prediction interval. Um, and you can see that um, I'm capturing almost all of my data here. It looks like maybe I didn't quite catch that dot within my interval. I think I just barely caught that one, but the vast majority of my data I'm actually catching within that, that interval, and it, it has to be pretty wide in order to do that. 